Well, good morning. My name is Nate. I'm the lead pastor here at Restoration Church. So glad that you're here. Uh, I got to meet some of you before service. Hope to have the chance to meet some of you after service. Uh, for those of you um, maybe who've been staying up to date on my life, let me let me give you uh, just a little update for um, for those of you who know or don't know. I'll catch up to speed. On Christmas Eve. Um, my mom was on her way to the 2 o'clock service, and she slipped on the ice and broke her hip. So um, I, you ask how she's doing. She, made it, she managed to make her way here today, so she's here. Um, so uh, she had surgery for a hip replacement the day after Christmas, and um, so that's what's been going on kind of in her life and I, in our lives a little bit, because... When my sister heard the news, she moved to Kentucky on Friday. So, um, so that's that's what's been going on for us. So, I just want to just say thank you to everybody who went and visited her in hospital. Everybody who just helped to get things set for her before she was, came out of the hospital. So, just thank you guys for all of that. Um, so, she's on her way to Christmas Eve service, and officially. We have 505 people at our Christmas Eve services, which is absolutely amazing. That is the, the largest service we've ever had in our church's history. But I think we should count it as 506 because she was honestly on her way uh, before she fell and had to call 911 and then, uh, and then uh, spent it in an ambulance. Uh, so 506, I think, officially is what we'll put down in the books. Uh, but absolutely amazing, uh, everything that God did over Christmas Eve and then just everything that he's been doing. So last week, I went to Plymouth. Those of you who don't know, we have a second location in Plymouth through an amazing series of events that happened uh, last year. And so I went there last year. Uh, Pastor John preached here, and Pastor Chris preached in Plymouth. And so I went there to host a service, and it was just really neat to be there and be a part of it. So one, there were people coming in who'd never met me before, but they'd seen me preach. And so there was a lot of like puzzled looks, like people walking by me in the hallway, and then they'd realize like who they were, and they'd come introduce themselves. And um, and then it was just great, like before service and after service, um, hearing people's stories and meeting people. So, we, you know, one thing that we do is so we record me preaching here, and then we play it in Plymouth. And some of you would be like, I'd never want to do that, and and probably even me, like a little bit. I just wonder how effective it would be. Like, I'm not that good enough of a preacher that people would want to watch me on video. But um, it, despite my inadequacies, like, God's been able to use it. And so one guy has been part of a church who's been part of the church for a number of years and went through the merger. Um, he said to me before service, like, he said, thank you so much for your messages because every week God does something in my life. And I was just blown away that that God would do that. And then... And then I was able to meet so many people who just started coming to the church since we officially launched as Restoration Church in, in November. So I was able to meet Bill, and Bill was serving and volunteering and opening, the, you know, while he was being an usher, serving as an usher, and he said, um, uh, he's been to a lot of churches uh, in his life, um, but he's got a son who's maybe late 20s, early 30s, who has an addiction problem, and he's been always trying to bring his son to church, but the son never wants to go. And if he does get his son to show up at a church service, he'll leave halfway through. He'll just bolt and leave halfway through. So Restoration Church, new to the area, so he brings his son to the launch Sunday on November 5th. And when the service ended, his son turned to his dad and said, is it over already? And he said, yeah. And his son said, I'll come back here. And so the dad made Restoration Church his home church. The son came back the next week. Then the son checked himself into rehab. And when I was there last week, the son was there. And so the dad was like thanking me. Thank you so much for coming here because it's changed. It's just changed our family. And my son now willingly goes to church where I've been fighting him his entire life to come. And that's amazing that we get to be a part of that, that everything that that we're doing and just everything that you just, we're making an impact on people's lives in a place that some of you will never go, uh, especially because it's colder there than it is here, and, and you're impacting people that you'll never meet. It's unbelievable. It's amazing. And it doesn't stop there. Um, 
You heard us on the Christmas, we talked about the Christmas Eve offering, and we have two things that we'll up, be updating you on soon. But one of the third thing that we talked about was um, that the remainder of the money after those two, the first two projects would go toward launching a third location in Londonderry. And before we were ever talking about Plymouth, we were talking with uh, some families in Londonderry about what would it look, or families in that area, what would it look like if we if we started a restoration church in your area. And then Plymouth happened, so we've been ta- we talked about that for six months, and now it's time to talk about Londonderry again. So starting tonight, we're starting meetings at the Londonderry Middle School from 5 to 6 p.m., and we're just going to see what happens. We're going to start meeting there every week at that time frame, and then there's 17 people from that area committed to that church right now. So when that just about doubles, when it gets to 35, 40 people, we're going to set a date on the calendar to launch, and then we'll officially start as Restoration Church there on Sunday mornings at some time in the future. It could be weeks from now. It could be a few months from now. We don't really know. We just know that God opened these doors. And, um, we, you know, we were kind of, you, you know, we we're looking at, it, at that area and not exactly sure where to go. Um, we had been talking about Nashua, but it just didn't, it just didn't feel right. No, no, none of the doors were opening. So over Thanksgiving... Uh, you know, I'm just like, maybe I should rethink about Londonderry. And it's been on my radar since 2008. And always in my, in, in my heart thought, like, that, that's a community that doesn't have a church like ours. And, um, and it's a large community. It's 24,000 people. It's, it's a large community. But no church like ours there. And, and so when I came back from Thanksgiving, I called the people from there. And I was just wondering, like, hey, would you guys be interested in, if we moved it to this and it was, they had been talking about it and been hoping that we'd go to Londonderry. So it just seemed like a confirmation. And then when we went to the middle school to, visit, to look at the property, they were really hospitable to us. And the custodian told us, if you give me your coffee, I'll, I'll brew it for you before you guys get here. So when you arrive, there's hot coffee ready. And I was just like looking at Don, who we went and looked at the building together. And I'm like, I don't... I, I think that's confirmation. Like if someone's like, I'll make your coffee for you. Like I think that's confirmation. So yeah, so we, we reserved every, every Sunday night for the year. And, um, and then we'll, we'll move that to Sunday mornings at some point. We'll hire staff at some point. We're just going to go for it and see what happens. So be praying for that. And then some of you, if you want to be a part of that, you want to drive to uh, uh, London area every Sunday night and just be a part of seeing it firsthand, seeing what God does, being in there at the very beginning and then celebrating when there's a couple hundred people there later this year, um, we invite you to be a part of it. Let me know. You can let me know after service that you're coming and so I can expect to see you there and, um, and you're invited to be a part. So be praying about that. It's amazing and exciting and unbelievable, everything that's happening. Um, well, let's move into, let's move into our message uh, we're starting a series today called This Year Will Be Different. For me personally, I'm never really negative about the previous year, uh, no matter how bad they are. And we've talked about some bad things uh, during the last, during December, about different things that have happened in our, in my, in our family's life. Um, it, but I'm never really negative about it. And I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm never posting on Facebook like, oh, I'm so glad this year will be over and, and, and not like that. Because even if bad things have happened, in my life, God's always done good things too. And for me, as much as I, I don't, I'm not negative about the previous year, I'm always really excited about the next year. Because I think if God did all of this in 2017, what is he going to do in 2018? And that's, that's my perspective and, and my excitement as I consider it. Uh, but knowing that, knowing that's my personality... In July of 2017, so six months ago, I started telling uh, Michelle, my wife, next year will be different, and begin to make promises to her. Next year will be different. And so now here we are in 2018, and just trying to live it out and saying, this year will be different. So kind of out of that, that the idea for this series um, was born and, and out of that experience. So let me tell you why I said that and some of the things that have been going on in our life that caused us to say that. So um, I'm lead pastor here, but I also, we're part of a fellowship of churches called the Assemblies of God, which are, they're international, they're all over the world. And, um, and I serve um, the Assemblies, I serve the Assemblies of God for 
uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine as district youth director and as assistant superintendent. So as district youth director, I help put on, I help organize convention and youth camp that our teenagers go to and, and some of those things. So now before I took on that role, Michelle and I, we put on all the dates of the calendar that that would require of me, all the things they wanted me to go to, all the things I wanted to go to, plus our church calendar and all the overnights that were required of that. And we kind of looked at it, and it was a lot of dates, but we just felt like it was right for us. We could, we could do this adjustment as, our, as a family and, and, um, and navigate it, and it would be beneficial for us. So we had all those nights of travel. Additional dates got added on to that that uh, we weren't expecting. And then... Um, then in May, we bought another house. So the no house, the no heat house that I talked about a couple of weeks ago, we sold that and then bought the house that I grew up in. So um, when I was 18, we moved out of this house and I bought it off the lady who bought it off my parents. And um, so it's been a fun adventure, but it was a complete fix me up. And it was, it was just beat. Things that needed to be updated when my parents bought the house in 1987 still needed to be updated. So like... It, it was honestly amazing how much of a time capsule it was. And I found actually my old punching bag in the basement. It was still there after all these years. It was, it was pretty, pretty crazy. Um, so, but it was, I mean, it was a complete fixer-upper. For three weeks, we, we moved into the house for three weeks. Um, uh, my wife and our four kids shared one bedroom because it was like the only place that was remotely clean right now. It's the worst room in the house. But that's the room we lived in. Uh, for three three weeks, we went without a kitchen sink for four months while we were trying to work. So I'd be traveling, and then when I'd come home, I'd be working on the house. And um, if I wasn't here at the church, I was working on the house, and it was nonstop. So I was really unavailable to my kids, because if I wasn't gone, I was on a project, and my kids hated this year. They they hated it. And so I just begin to, I just begin to tell Michelle, like, next year is going to be different. We're not going to run this tight of a travel schedule, and we're not going to have these urgent projects on our, on our, in our lives. And um, so, I, you know, this year, 2018, I want to be able to rest. I want to have a hobby. I'd like to uh, sit on my deck and drink an Arnold Palmer. Like, I just I don't want the, the pressing urgency against us and against our life. And uh, I just know we need we need, my family, we need to make that change. And, and so we've begun. We've, we've started that. Now, maybe you don't have the travel schedule, but maybe you feel that same tension. Something has to change. I just can't, I can't live another 2017. I can't keep living the way I've been living all these years. Something has to change. This year has to be different. As you look at Last year, you look at the last few years and maybe even the last few decades, you look and you are repeating the same mistakes over and over again. It's the same relationship mistakes and, and it's an, as a new guy or a new girl, but the same problems, the same, you know, you're, you're, the same types of problems, the same type of relationship mistakes, uh, the same financial mistakes, you're making them over and over again. You're dealing this year with the same sins and the same problems you were dealing with last, last year. Or maybe even think about it a different way. You have the same unfulfilled dreams that you've had for the last few years. You just keep saying, this is going to be the year you do it. This is the year you take the step of faith. But still, nothing's been happening. You've been saying for years now, oh, I'm going to write a book and you still haven't done it. I'm going to go on a missions trip and you still haven't done it. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to college and you still haven't. Uh, you, you still haven't moved forward in that. You're not doing anything to accomplish it. You're, you're just living in that. And, and maybe you think, like, this year will be different. You know what? This year can be different. You don't have to, be re- you don't have to just keep reliving the life you've been living. This can be the year that something finally changes, that, that, um, that, you, that you see those things accomplished. And you know what? This year should be different. God didn't call us to live this mundane, monotonous life where we go to work and then Sunday we show up and go to church and then go to work and then show up and go to church. That's not what he's called us to. If we're, if we're following him and, 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 and 
staying close to him, then really this life is more, it should be more of an adventure than what we've been probably experiencing. And yeah, there's the routine that we go through and there's the, you know, the nine to five that we, that we go through, but that is not like the peak and pinnacle of the life that God's called us to. So this year can be different. This year should be different. But you know what? Kind of in, I, I say this in faith over you. This year will be different. It really will be different. You don't have to just say that or convince yourself that. This year will be different if you will follow Jesus, if you will stay close to him, if you will um, keep your heart after him. If, it's gonna, if this year is going to be different, though, then you have to live different. You just can't keep living the same way that you've been living. And this is where people tend to give up before they even start. They get overwhelmed at the very beginning. It's, you know, oh, great, I'm going to have more things to do. You're like, oh, this is the year, this is it, I'm going to go to college, and then you open up your FAFSA report, the, the, your FAFSA paperwork, and you're like, it's too much, I can't do it, I quit. Like, I, you know, it's not for me. And you just give up before you even get going. Things are going to get worse with that attitude. If you give up before you ever try, if you convince yourself it can never happen before you ever try, things aren't going to get better and things aren't going to stay the same. Things are going to get worse. But as we look through this series and as we kind of get in the word this morning, it's not about doing. It's not about, you know, you're going to change your life and you're going to make this to-do list. And if you get everything done on this to-do list, then this year will be different. It's different than that. It's about becoming. It's not about what you have to do. It's about allowing God to transform you into something, to become something that right now you aren't. Allowing Jesus to grow you, to change you, and to help you. And that takes uh, some of the pressure off. It should take a lot of the pressure off because it's not another thing you have to get done. It's just kind of yielding yourself to, to Jesus and the, plan he, and the plans he has for you. And he does the hard work. You stay close to him, and he does the hard work of changing you and, and, uh, and, and moving in your life. The theme verse for this series is Proverbs chapter 3, um, verses 5 and 6. And it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. and Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. If you trust in God with all your heart, if you stay close to him, He'll lead you on the path out of where you are. He'll lead you. He'll be the one who makes this year different than your previous years. And you know what? Jesus wants this year to be different for you. He wants you to live in the abundant life he created you to live in. And he wants you to become the person he created you to be. He hasn't given up on you. So he isn't looking like, oh, man, I had these great plans for you, but uh, actually on second thought, I take it back, um, you know, I found someone better. And every single one of us are on that journey of becoming, every single one of us are on that journey of, of him leading us to where he wants us to be. None of us are 100% perfected. Not me as a pastor, I mean, there's areas of my life that... God wants me to grow and change and become more like him this year. And every single one of us, that's, that, that's true for us. We're all on that journey. If you've got your Bibles, open to Proverbs 9. And um, in this series, we're going to be in the book of Proverbs. So for the next few weeks, we're going to be in the book of Proverbs. And Proverbs was written... Uh, by a guy named Solomon around 900 B.C., and there are parts of Proverbs that weren't written by him, but he collected uh, the writings of other writers and included it in the book of Proverbs. And so when you read a chapter in Proverbs where it says, like, Proverbs 9, there'll be sometimes some very fine print that will tell you who the author is. And so you, you, you can know which parts were written by him and which parts were assembled by him. And he warns about four, time, four types of people in the book of Proverbs uh, at different parts, and, and some parts very specifically. Uh, and he warns about the foolish, the sluggard, the seductress, and the scoffer. 
And we're going to look at those four types of people this series. And he's giving a warning. So he's writing it as a per, per, from the perspective of a son, uh, excuse me, a father writing to his son and giving and, and just saying, you, you know, my son, pay attention to these things. And so we're going to look at that. And he is telling his son, don't go near these types of people. You want your life to be different. Don't go near these types of people because they're going to take you off course from where God wants to bring you and what God wants to do. And then he says, and especially, don't become these types of people. And everybody can, can kind of be guilty of this. It can, you can very quickly become a person who's a scoffer. And you mock things and are critical of things and question things. So as he's writing, he, he's talking about, well, talk about foolishness and foolish people here at the beginning. Um, as he's writing, he talks about, he, he's writing with a comparison of wisdom and folly. And he's, he's talking about them and kind of telling a story about lady wisdom and lady folly. Now, wisdom and folly are intangible things, but this is a perfect sonification to help us to understand how they work and how they function and to help us to, um, to really understand them better. Now, let me define them before we go on, because they may have a different definition. The Bible definition may be different than how you define it yourselves. Wisdom is the practical knowledge by which we gain true and lasting happiness. It's knowing something. Knowing, it's like you know God's word, but then you're practically applying it to your life. That's wisdom. Proverbs 3.13 says, Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gets understanding. There's happiness and wisdom that you won't find anywhere else. Folly, this is not just, uh, this is not just foolishness, but, but deeper than that. When the Bible speaks of fools and folly, it's not referring to a mental deficiency. It's not just people who are, who are, who are dumb. But it speaks to a moral perversity. And this isn't just perversion, but you're living differently than the way you know you should. So trying to think of an example to, uh, to define this for you, to help you to capture it and get it. So over, uh, over the holidays, between Christmas and New Year's, I was going to many, one of my many trips to Home Depot because of all the house projects I'm still doing. And when I got up to the self-checkout, there was a, a little paper sign on the register that I had never seen before, and it said this. Uh, Home Depot credit cards are limited three per person. And I thought, you can have more than one Home Depot credit card? Like, this has opened my mind to a world of possibilities. And, like, just imagine, just imagine like, who discovered that? Like, who tried to do that? And, and why would you want more than one? And I think having three Home Depot credit cards is probably, a, like, a great depiction or great illustration of folly because we probably all know like in our wisdom we we shouldn't have credit cards but then they have three store credit cards to the same store like why would you need that like that's pretty foolish you're like i've got one for my tools and i've got one for flooring and i've got this third credit card for led light bulbs like why you know so as we look through this as we study this, wisdom and folly are similar, and that's what Solomon begins to write in this story. And he says uh, they're similar because they invite everyone. Everyone's invited to the gathering of wisdom. Everyone's invited to the gathering hosted by folly. And we tend to think that wisdom is ex exclusive. That, um, you know... You, Common people like us, we could, we, you know, we could never be wise. We're just ordinary, simple folk. But wisdom has an open invitation to everyone. Some people think, you know, I could never be wise because I can't afford college. But college isn't wisdom. College is beneficial depending on what career path you're going on. But college is not wisdom. And wisdom and folly are similar because they both have something to offer us. But we begin to see the differences when we begin to look at what they offer. Proverbs chapter 9. Uh, you can keep your Bible open because we'll jump around to a couple of different verses uh, this morning. At Proverbs 9 verses 5 and 6, this is Lady Wisdom speaking and she says, Come, 
Eat my food and drink the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways behind and begin to live. Learn to use good judgment. Wisdom offers life. And I love what that says here in this verse. Begin to live. How many of us are living? We're just experiencing life and experiencing all the great things that Jesus has for us. How many are, are in that? And that's what wisdom offers us. Not just an existence, but a life. Folly offers excitement. In Proverbs 9, 17, Lady Folly is inviting people to come to a banquet as well with stolen food. And she says, Stolen water is refreshing. Food eaten in secret tastes the best. Folly offers excitement. Wisdom offers life. Folly offers excitement. Folly offers things that are free, secret, wrong, but exciting. Probably none of us you know, are guilty of drinking stolen water. I don't think that's probably very common. Um, or eating food in secret, but it's speaking to something deeper than that. Some of the things that you have in your life that are free, secret, wrong, and exciting, maybe those things you look at through your incognito browser. Those are the things that Folly is using to entice you, offering excitement to you. Folly offers things that make you feel good. So you participate. You know probably you shouldn't. And maybe even you don't want to, but you still participate in it because you like it. Because it's exciting, because it's fun. Wisdom offers to make your life good. Folly offers things that feel good. Wisdom offers to make your life good. And there's a difference because while wisdom offers true and lasting happiness, what folly offers is a short-term happiness, a short-term pleasure. When I was, uh, I had this one memory of my grandfather, my dad's dad. Uh, we're French Canadians, so we call him Pepe, so Pepe Gagne. Uh, I had this one memory of him. Now, I was two and a half years old when he died, so I just always assumed this memory was made up. Like, it was just a fabrication of my imagination. Um, but when I was a teenager, I finally asked my mom about it. Like, I've got this memory of Pepe Gagne. I always thought it was a dream, but could it be true? And my memory was, we lived in Dover. We lived in Dover, and, um, and I was up on the counter, and it was nighttime. The fluorescent tube was on over the kitchen sink, and my grandfather wheeled himself into the kitchen uh, on his wheelchair, and I was on the counter eating sugar out of the, out of the container on the counter. And I was eating it. My grandfather wheeled his chair in, and he said, uh, you shouldn't eat that. That's bad for you. That's my memory. So I never thought about it. I finally asked my mom, and she said, yeah, that's a memory, and let me give you some background. He was telling you not to eat sugar because he was diabetic. So that's why, that's why he told that to you. And then he was in a wheelchair because he lost his, he had his leg amputated because he was a diabetic but didn't change the way he ate. So he had his leg amputated because he was diabetic. So all of a sudden now, I have this memory of my grandfather um, and uh, as a, just a little kid and, um, and, and all the pieces are put together in it. Now my grandfather, he, he lost his leg. He's not in war, but because he couldn't stop eating sugar. And not just he couldn't, but he wouldn't stop. He just liked it. And he didn't care what the circumstances were. He was going to continue to eat it. That is probably, I mean, that's probably, that's folly. You know you shouldn't do something, but you do it anyway. That's folly. Now, wisdom offers life. Folly offers excitement. And we just think like, well, no big deal, uh, you know, it's, fo it's my folly. I like it. It's not hurting anybody. And we just think, you know, stay out of my business. And I'll stay out of your business, but uh, you're in the church today, so you're in my business. Uh, so um, so they, 
they not only differ in what they offer, but they differ in where they lead. So verse 9, 11, wisdom, what does it offer? What does it lead to? Wisdom will multiply your days and add years to your life. What does folly lead to? People who pursue folly, verse number 18, little do they know that the dead are there. Her guests are in the depths of the grave. This past year, um, uh, there are some people in our church who were just seem to be affected by, by people overdosing. Uh, it seemed almost for a while. It just seemed like every week someone else they knew passed away from overdosing on drugs. So I'm going to just give an illustration, but I speak very sensitively toward that and not trying to make anybody feel uncomfortable or hurt anybody, but but just to help us to understand this, folly offers excitement, and it's that first time someone says, hey, why don't you come to a party? Why don't you try this? It's a lot of fun. But where does it lead? It leads to, to a physical death for some people. They continue pursuing something that eventually they don't want anymore, but they can't seem to get rid of. And for some people, maybe it's not a physical death, but it's a, but it's a death in their soul, a death in their emotions, a, a death in, in their dreams, a death in their relationships as they're not able to sustain anything anymore as they just pursue this addiction. In other areas of life, maybe those things on your incognito browser, if you're looking at things and viewing things and and uh, and just like it's just whatever, but that excitement leads to an affair, which leads to a death in your marriage, a death in your relationship with your kids, and depending on what your career is, a death of your career. And we see this all over the place now: is news anchors losing their jobs, politicians losing their jobs, and and for me personally, I know pastors losing their jobs and their careers. Because folly was exciting, but folly always leads to death. What we, who we choose, what we choose, will determine the outcome of your year, will determine the path of your life. So what will you choose? Wisdom or folly? Now, to reject wisdom is to choose folly. There's no, you, you know, it's like, ah, I'm not going to be, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with wisdom. I don't want to have anything to do with, with living the way God wants me to live. Uh, but I'm not going to, you know, I, I, I'm not foolish either. I'm just going to ignore that. It's, just, it's either pursuing wisdom if you're not pursuing wisdom, then that is folly. That is in itself its own folly. Proverbs 14, 8 says, The wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way, but the folly of fools is deceiving. And then uh, Ephesians 5, 15 says, So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. So, that first verse, the prudent, the prudent man understands where his decisions are, are going to lead to eventually. So when, as I began to live last year with my travel and renovation schedule, I had to, I, I just knew that our current pace of life was not going to bring us where we wanted to go to. And I knew that if I keep traveling like this and working like this and having meetings like this, um, where that's gonna where where is that gonna bring my kids one day as they're bitter toward their dad who didn't spend time with them as they're bitter toward the church who was always working at and they become bitter toward God and that's not where I want to bring them and lead them in my life and I had to know that and make that change as um, uh, uh, you know in in our 
in our renovation schedule and in our life, like to know if I keep traveling like this, if I keep this pace of life, what is that going to do to my marriage one day? And where is that going to lead? If we keep having six of us live in one bedroom, what's that going to do to our marriage? And, and just like, you just begin to, to think through and if I keep this up. And so it's just, just out, of, out of frustration, probably, I, you know, I said to Michelle, like out of frustration, next year will be different. Like, We've done six months of this. We've got obligations through the next of the year. You don't have a kitchen sink yet, but next year will be different. And then practically working hard to make things different. Wisdom is knowing I can't stay on this path anymore. And for me, I need to become a person who rests in God and, and takes the Sabbath like like I have before and like I know he, he, he wants from me and he's commanded me to do. What is it for you? What needs to change in your life? And the bigger question is, who do you want to become? God cares more about me uh, being a, 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 a godly husband than he cares about me being a great pastor. God cares more about me being a great dad and a godly dad than he does about me uh, having influence and helping other churches in our fellowship of churches. He wants me to become those things. What does he want you to become? What is it that he wants you to become? And then the question is, how will you pursue wisdom? Obviously, a practical thing to do is, you know, we open God's Word, we open the Bible every week, and that's an easy way for you to pursue wisdom. In February, we have circle sign-ups, which are groups that meet in people's homes, and they open the Bible every week, and that's a great place to pursue wisdom. So what, what are you going to do? pursue that, to pursue Jesus, to follow Jesus. If you'll close your eyes, I want to take just a moment and pray. You are here this morning and you just know this year needs to be different. Maybe you're hoping, I, I really hope this year could be different. If you are going to pursue wisdom, it starts with following Jesus. Bible says he's the beginning and end of wisdom. He's the creator of wisdom. And so to, per, to pursue Jesus is to pursue wisdom. And so that's where it starts for you today. You make a decision. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to give him my life. I'm going to lead you in a prayer that you can, you can just pray. You can whisper where you're seated. Maybe you're not sure yet. You can write it down and, um, and pray it at your house. But this is the starting place for your life and the change in your life. And everybody's invited to participate. So I'm going to pray a prayer, and you can paraphrase this in your own words, but just helping you express with your mouth what's going on in your heart. You can pray something like this. Jesus, I give you my life today, and I'm making a decision to follow you. I confess my sins to you and ask you to forgive me, and I believe you're God's son and that you came to save me. Today, I follow you. I make you my Lord and my God. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. If you keep your eyes closed, why don't you just begin to think? The band is going to play here uh, just for a minute just to give you time to process and you keep your eyes closed but I want you I want you to think about next year July 7th 2019 and I want you to begin to imagine that what you're praying about right now is no longer a reality you're different you've become who right now you're praying you'll become you're not lonely, 
You're not addicted. You're content. You're disciplined. You're joyful. You have peace. Imagine that you're that person next year. You pursue Jesus. You pursue pursued wisdom and you become a different person. He's he's transformed you from the inside out. What will that feel like to be that person next year? What will that feel like to finally be free?